The Achaemenid Empire lasted 208 years. The Macedonian Empire of Alexander the Great lasted 231. The Roman Republic lasted 233. The Romanov Russia lasted 234. Today, the United States of America is 244 years old. What happens next? Where do we go from here? What do we build out of the ashes? Hello, I'm Kanaz Filan, and these are notes from the end of time. Hello again, everybody. This is Kanaz Filan. I'm with you here tonight for the fourth episode of Notes from the End of Time. This podcast just keeps growing and growing. And tonight I wanted to talk about two of the greatest writers of 20th century England, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. In 1931, Lewis and Tolkien were both junior dons at Oxford College, They had another friend, Hugo Dyson. They had this small circle. Of the three of them, they all had an enormous interest in English literature, English folklore, Germanic folklore, and Greek mythology. Hugo Dyson, who went on to become a great Shakespeare scholar, well regarded in England, was a high church Anglican. J.R.R. Tolkien was, of course, a Roman Catholic. Now their friend Jack, C.S. Lewis was known as Jack to his friends, had been an ardent atheist from his teenage years till in 1929 he finally acknowledged to himself that yes, he felt there was a God out there. He became a deist. He, He described himself as the most dejected and reluctant convert in England at this time. And so he was aware, okay, there's some higher power out there. And I like myths. Mythology is great fun. You can learn a lot from mythology. But they're not truths. You can't treat the resurrection as being any more true than the idea when lightning strikes, that's Thor tossing a hammer from the sky. As he allegedly described this, you know, Myths were lies, but lies breathed through silver. Tolkien's response was actually 141 lines of 48 lines of heroic couplets. His biographer, Humphrey Carter, summed up the basic response as, No, they're not lies. <laughs> Just as speech is invention about objects and ideas, so myth is invention about truth. We have come from God, and inevitably the myths woven by us, though they contain error, will also reflect a splintered fragment of the true light, the eternal truth that is with God. Indeed, only by myth-making, only by becoming a sub-creator and inventing stories, can man aspire to the state of perfection he knew before the fall? Our myths may be misguided, but they steer, however shakily, toward the true harbor, while materialistic progress leads only to a yawning abyss and the iron crown of the power of evil. A few days later, Lewis wrote to a friend, I have just passed on from believing in God to definitely believing in Christ, in Christianity. My long night talk with Dyson and Tolkien had a great deal to do with it. And one of the things that Lewis found most convincing was he made a serious study of the New Testament of Christian literature, and he decided that based on the New Testament, Jesus Christ could be either liar, lunatic, or Lord. It's known as Lewis's trilemma. What he meant was that in the available scriptures, Jesus Christ refers to himself as the Son of God. In John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. In Luke, with the Sanhedrin, ask him, Are you the Christ? 
Jesus says, hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. And they ask back, you know, art thou the Son of God? And he replies, you say that, ye say that I am. Now Mark 1462, Christ replies more bluntly, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in on the clouds of heaven. Okay, here Jesus is declaring himself the Son of God. Jesus is declaring himself divine. You can object here that, well, we don't know if the historical Jesus ever said that. There's definitely something to that objection. Our earliest mention in church literature of an actual what we call the quadriform gospel or our four gospels is from a letter by saint Irenaeus of Lyon. he mentions four gospels in his work against heresies the new testament canon that we have today was made official in 367 by saint Ath athanasius but when we look at early church history, we can see from the earliest days the Christians believed that Jesus Christ had been born of a virgin, had died on a cross, and had risen from the dead. Early Christians certainly could have called Jesus a prophet, like Jeremiah, like Isaac. They could have called him a great teacher, like Pythagoras, like Plato, First century Rome, late antiquity in general, had no shortage of holy men or deep thinkers. If they wanted to present Jesus as a world teacher or as a guru or as a spiritual leader, the language to do that was available to them. Examples of that were available to them. But they insisted that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. The Gospel of John says in the beginning was the word or as it would have said in greek the logos and the word was with god and the word was god he was in the beginning with god all things came to be through him and without him nothing came to be what came to be through him was life and this life was the light of the human right race the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we saw his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. About 30 years after the crucifixion, we have a record from Tacitus of Nero's persecution of the Christian sect at that time. As he said, to stop the rumor that he had set Rome on fire, Nero, falsely charged with guilt and punished with the most fearful tortures, the persons commonly called Christians, who were generally hated for their enormities. Christus, the founder of that name, was put to death as a criminal by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea, in the reign of Tiberius. But the pernicious superstition, repressed for a time, broke out yet again not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also, whither all things horrible and disgraceful fall, flow from all quarters as to a common receptacle, and where they are encouraged. Accordingly, first those who were arrested who confessed they were Christians, next on their information a vast multitude were convicted not so much on the charge of burning the city as of hating the human race. And what they meant by hating the human race was Christians refused to participate in public religious festivals. They refused to do things like dump a pinch of incense for the emperor's health. They declared all other faiths were blasphemies and that they could worship only the one true God and the one true Son of God, Jesus Christ. You know, as Tacitus rather impolitely observed, Rome was open to foreign religions. They tolerated them. They even welcomed them. You had the Serapis cult. You have the Isis cult. 
both of those out of Egypt, the Mithras cult, which comes from Persia, the Kabbalah, who had come from the Levantine region. There were deities from throughout the empire. You could find temples to them in Rome, but those gods were expected to live alongside the Roman gods. There were Roman festivals that were supposed to be held. You were supposed to join in those. It was fine for you to place your god alongside the Roman gods. When you tried to overthrow them, Heliogabalus, who had worshipped Algabal, a Syrian god, tried to make, tried to change the religion and tried to move Algabal, the statue, into the stone, into temples that were meant for the Roman gods. And, you know, that emperor wound up getting dragged through the streets along with his family and his body tossed in the Tiber. And so we know that within decades after the death of Jesus, you had people who were convinced he had risen from the dead, who believed that he was the son of the only God, and that it was blasphemy to worship other gods. This would definitely put you in conflict with Rome, but the salient point here is that within decades after his death, Christians believed that Christ was the Son of God, and they continue to believe that throughout Christian history. So did those first missionaries who spread this religion, the apostles or the people who came after the apostles, did they lie about this resurrection? Well, let's look at the very early history of the church. St. John is the only apostle who dies of old age. He dies in, in exile in Patmos. So I believe Bartholomew is skinned alive. St. Andrew is crucified on a St. Andrew's cross. St. Peter is crucified on an upside-down cross. Paul is beheaded. Mark is dragged, the, the gospel Mark, the author, is dragged through streets behind horses. I mean, this was not a big money-making opportunity. If you wanted to come up with a lie to get people's attention, you could have made a much safer and a much more lucrative living being a soothsayer. You could have, they could have pretended to be healers, magicians. If you're going to lie, these people were willing to not, not just to die, but to die horribly for their lies. Let's go with door number two that Lewis offered the lunatic. Let's suppose Jesus Christ wrongly believed himself to be the Son of God, you know, to believe that he was the way, the truth, and the life. There are definitely psychoses, mental illnesses that can cause delusions of grandeur. There are even delusions that can cause you to think you're God. Now, Roman Judea, the, Christ was not the only Messiah out there. There were a number of pseudo messi they call the pseudo messianic figures during that time. Josephus, who was a Hellenized Jew, he wrote about several of them. One Theodos claimed to be a prophet, and he told his four hundred or so followers to come with him to the Jordan River, and he was going to divide the Jordan for them. Well, what happened was a troop of horsemen showed up while he was trying to divide the river. They slew Thoidas, they slew most of the followers, and sold the rest of them into slavery. There was an Egyptian who claimed that he was going to knock down the walls of Jerusalem, he brought 30,000 followers to the Mount of Olives. He did not knock down the walls of Jerusalem. Roman soldiers killed many of his followers. He managed to escape, apparently went back to Egypt. Josephus had no more to say about him after that. But you will note the messianic cults around these gentlemen, around other messianic figures, died with their founder. Jesus was such a charismatic lunatic, were he a lunatic, 
that he managed to convince his apostles that not only could he raise the dead, but that he rose from the dead. And I know today it's fashionable to think that all religion is mental illness, certainly to talk about how the church is responsible for sexual repression and for promoting authoritarian personalities and doing all sorts of mentally unhealthy things. But this lunacy that Jesus infected the world with, it certainly sometimes led people to do bad things, but it also at times led them to feed the hungry, care for the sick, live a moral life, build cathedrals. This is a very, very strange type of mental illness. So, so let's suppose we eliminate the idea that Jesus was a liar, and we eliminate the idea that Jesus is a lunatic. Well, then we're left with one really terrifying conclusion. He was telling the truth. He really is the Son of God. And that's certainly not an airtight argument. I will grant you that. But if you have an airtight argument, you no longer have a matter of faith. And certainly plenty of people throughout history have dismissed Christ as a conjurer or a scoundrel, a liar, worse than that. Most of your ardent unbelievers and fedora atheists wouldn't even think the trilemma worth considering. And because of their Christian beliefs, both Lewis and Tolkien have garnered a reputation in the mod among a lot of modern critics as being old reactionaries, you know, just fuddy-duddies looking back on this verdant green past that never really existed. Both Lewis and Tolkien have garnered a reputation among many critics today for being reactionaries, for being these escapists trying to recreate the verdant green England of their childhoods. Tolkien's been referred to as a technophobe, a Luddite. Michael Moorcock referred to his work as a pernicious confirmation of the values of a morally bankrupt middle class. In a 1978 piece entitled Epic Pooh, he compared Tolkien unfavorably to A.A. A. Milne. And to be fair, Lord of the Rings, to a lesser extent the Chronicles of Narnia, spawned a whole lot of imitators who gave us busty princesses, heroic heroes, evil monsters vanquished by magic swords, the the 60s and the 70s even into the 80s there was the bookshelves were just flooded with this bad swords and sorcery leonard nimoy sang the ballad of Bal bilbo baggins you've probably seen that one on youtube i mean to give due credit nimoy did less disservice to tolkien with that than william shatner's rocket man did to ray bradbury elton john and bernie taupin but the problem was that tolkien and lewis were myth-makers seeking the true harbor. Their imitators, and most, a lot of the people that were reading them, were really not interested in seeking the true harbor and creating myths. They wanted to escape an unpleasant reality. But, you know, some people wanted to just frolic through these imaginary landscapes, and others wanted to scoff at the reactionary fairy tales, but there was a deeper meaning and a deeper view to Tolkien stuff. One of the reasons it became so popular is when it comes out in the 60s, you have polluted rivers catching fire, you've got napalm being dropped in Vietnamese jungles, and there was a real longing for a pre-technological age. Let's look at some of his work that was published posthumously for what he was what he was writing at that time behind the Lord of the Rings. And the Silmarillion, one of the main characters in the Silmarillion is Melkor, who later becomes the Dark Lord Morgoth. Melkor wants to gain dominion over Arda, what will become Middle Earth, and he but he wants to create but he cannot create, he cannot gain the power of creation. All he can do is corrupt and destroy. 
He manages to create orcs by torturing elves and using foul sorcery to transform them into these corrupted agents of evil. He's able to seduce some of the elves away from the holy powers through guile. But all of this comes at a terrible cost. He steals the Silmarils that are the subject matter of the Silmarillion, but the light because they hold the light of the two trees and it it burns his hands and they're ever seared and burning black and in pain. He he slays one of the great elves, Fingolfin, but as a result of that wound, he's forever limping and he's suffering from seven gaping wounds. And you know, the, the transformation into Morgoth, the Dark Lord, leaves him completely incapable of understanding things like mercy and pity. He does monstrous things for so long that he becomes a monster. He can't imagine the Anar, the gods, caring about the elves because the elves have disobeyed them so many times. And he's really surprised when the Anar come in with an onslaught and they finally throw him through the door of night into the void. It's telling when he steals those Silmarils, which are the light from the two trees, he places them in his iron crown. That's, again, you remember that word comes up in Tolkien earlier. Now, the Silmarils are created by Fëanor. He's the greatest of the elves. He's the greatest craftsman. He gives the people the elvish script. The Palantirs, you'll remember them if you've seen Lord of the Rings, you know the Seeing Stones. They were created by Fëanor, and his greatest achievement is creating the three jewels called the Silmarils. After he creates these jewels, Fëanor grows obsessed with them. He becomes suspicious of other people. He's afraid they're going to steal his Silmarils. He locks them away in an iron vault. Morgoth comes, he destroys the two trees, the gold tree and the silver tree, and he destroys, they breaks into the iron vault, he kills Feanor's father, and then he takes the gems. And Feanor leads the elves away from the land in the west, take, brings them back into Ardra, despite all the gods telling him, don't do this, don't do this, this is hopeless, and he brings this force into a, like this, losing war against Morgoth. Then his sons take an oath to avenge his death and retrieve the Silmarils at all costs, and there's just centuries of bloodshed, kinslaying, general evil deeds. When, he's fi when this finally ends and Morgoth is vanquished, Amaya, who had taken his play, a minor deity who was one of M Morgoth's earliest servants, he had been a Maya of Ole the Smith. They called him Meran, the Admired. He loved order and he loved precision and he just wanted to get control of all the wayward minds and all the creatures and bring them under his control. As he's working with Morgoth, he goes from be being Myron the Admired to Sauron the Abhorred. After Morgoth's defeat, he finally comes back to Mordor to try to get control of the world, he forges rings for men and dwarves and elves so he can bring them all under the power of his one ring. This plan, as you may know, ends badly. He mines up minus a finger and his ring. Isildur gets a ring. Isildur gets hit with arrows. Isildur loses a ring. Sauron's, Sauron's ring sinks into a river like a rock. Found by a hobbit named Smeagol. He goes into a cave a few centuries later. A thief named Baggins steals his precious. While all this is going on, another one of the Maiar who had worked with Ole the Smith, Kurumo, becomes corrupted when he starts looking for Sauron's ring so that he can get that power. And when he starts trying to learn how to master the art of ring making himself. And this is how Karumno, who is working in Middle-earth as Saruman, becomes corrupted and ultimately dies in the Shire as Sharky, this broken being stripped of everything but his silver voice and his spite. Tolkien was a 20th, 20th century Englishman. He didn't fear technology. 
It's he, like Heidegger, like many thinkers of that time, recognized the ways in which that that quest for knowledge can lead us astray. When those skills are used in the service of light and the truth, they can be great gifts. He was well aware of that, but when they're used wrongly, they can send us headlong into evil. They can leave us with wounds that never heal. They can make us monsters. When you prioritize order, efficiency, and power over beauty and truth and righteousness, you make the world Mordor. In 1945, C.S. Lewis's That Hideous Strength introduced us to a young married couple named Jane and Mark Studdock. Mark was a young academic. He had just become a senior fellow in sociology at Bracton College in England. His wife, Jane, they've been married for six months. She's chafing at the bit. She wants to get her PhD thesis finished, and she's slowly realizing that's never going to happen. She's having a lot of second thoughts about marriage, and Behind all this backdrop, she starts having these terrifying, vivid dreams that turn out to be prophetic. Meanwhile, the folks at Bracton College are trying to decide whether or not to sell Bracton Wood, one of the major landmarks of their campus, to the National Institute for Coordinated Experiments, or the NICE, the NICE is really seeking very hard to set up headquarters in Edgestow, and they seem especially interested in doing it in Bracton Wood, which is a lovely wood, but the most remarkable thing about it is this silly old legend that Bracton Wood is the final resting place of Merlin. And the people at NICE make it very clear that they are going to have Bracton Wood, they can either expropriate it through government means and give them a pittance for it, or they can pay a very reasonable sum and make sure everybody with at the college is taken care of. They also take an interest in Mark Sturrock, and Mark gets offered a position with NICE. He's encouraged to resign his fellowship with the college, and this is where we're introduced to the nice from Mark Sturrock's point of view. Mark is a decent fellow, not an especially bad fellow, but neither is he an especially good fellow. He's very much an everyman, and like C.S. Lewis, he knew what it was to be a struggling academic working on a pittance. Mark is also a very insecure person. He's constantly fretting about his place within the varying social circles within Bracton College. And when he first attends a nice party, he's trying to figure out who's who. And what he finds are these endless, intricate plots and subplots being warned who you had to fa curry favor with, who you had to avoid, each person you meet warning you about a different person. It's very unnerving, but yet Mark is seduced because these people are obviously very rich, very powerful, and very committed to a scientific vision. Mark really hopes he can put his knowledge of sociology to work for them, but what he winds up doing is writing pseudonymous articles, supporting nice goals, and having them planted in major papers. And he realizes, okay, I'm writing lies, but I'm doing it for a good cause, and these are desperate times. Maybe I'm going to look back on this the way old war vets do today. You know, oh, I remember when times were really rough and hard men had to do hard things and all that. He's convinced these are hard times because he's been told by several people here, the reactionary forces that are trying to slow up the nice, slow up scientific progress are willing to do violence against us, and they have done violence against us. 
He's also not sure exactly who these violent people are, though he is aware that they're near. Dr. Hingis, a dusty old relic who had tried to warn him against joining the Nice, went home from a party one night and found himself murdered. This is yet another prophetic dream that Jane has. Jane sees Dr. Hengist's murder in a dream just like earlier. She'd had a very vivid dream of a French scientist being guillotined. And so she goes to seek help. She talks to a woman she knew, like one of Mark's old tutors, who's been turned out of her house because Bra Bracton College has refused to renew the lease on the on it it's now being turned over to nice she tells mrs drimble about her dreams and mrs drimble recommends she go and see a miss ironwood after some trepidation she does go to talk about her dreams with them and she's very very unnerved when they start telling her no you don't need psychoanalysis no you don't need drugs you don't need therapy what is going on with you is you are dreaming true. They go on to tell her that her ability to dream true will be very important in a war that they can't really tell her much about, save to say that it's very, very important that she join them. And Jane, unsurprisingly, is more than a little bit skeptical about this. And as she leaves... Her husband, meanwhile, Mark, is growing increasingly skeptical about his position at Nice. The more he's hearing of their ideas, the less he likes them, and there's good reason for that. Nice has been turning people out of rented houses they'd lived in for generations. They're buying up land. They're bringing in laborers who are dusting up regularly with the locals. The nice police force is more brutal than the local police force, doesn't appear to be accountable to anybody. And Mark has continued writing articles for them, justifying all this, and he's even asked to write an article about an upcoming riot between the locals and nice employees, which will give nice police the opportunity to take over the Edgestow department as the first step in their plan to take over police departments all across England and ultimately the world. And Mark has been able up to now to convince himself to go along with this. Of course, they know better. They're very smart people. Progress must progress. A few eggs must be broken. All the lies we tell ourselves when we know we're doing evil. What? finally gets him is when they ask if he can bring his wife to their social club, if they can meet Jane. Lewis is inspired here by the concept of courtly love, the idea that a man would put his beloved in such a place that he would think of her constantly and thereby it's to be inspired to do good and to refrain from evil. This is a medieval tradition, of course, which started around the same time we start to see a lot of the intense devotion to the Virgin Mary within the Catholic Church, and it works for Mark. Mark starts having second thoughts, and he starts getting increasing pushback from the directors, from his co-workers, letting him know that if you don't play our way, we have means of keeping you in control. When he doesn't take their advice, he finds himself in jail, charged with the murder of Professor Hengist. Meanwhile, Jane is having her own problems with Miss Ironwood and the cast of people who want her to dream true for them, which is a Professor Arthur Ransom, Readers would have recognized him from Out of the Silent Planet and Paralandra, the first two books. He was the main character in those books. He's a secondary character here. He describes his, his team as four men, a few women, and a bear. And Mr. Bulbitude is a big, charming bear who wanders around a cottage. There's a fisher king there, it's, and all the things you'd come to expect from the guy who wrote Chronicles of Narnia. And, Jane is having a really hard time here. 
she sees there's something powerful here. She sees there's something holy, but they keep asking her things like, does she have permission from her husband? You know, letting her know that they're very angry. She used birth control. She does, She needs to make an heir for the line. And all these things, Jane's a modern woman, and she finds them offensive and belittling. And But yet she understands that there's some kind of power here that... She doesn't like everything she's hearing from them, but in her heart, she knows that it's true. And, and so Jane joins forces with the Motley crew because she's had a vision of the extraordinary. Meanwhile, back in his cell, Mark, who's sweating out murder charges, Nice is hoping they could still corrupt him, when if they can't, of course, they can just have him executed. He's realized during his time there, contrasting his feelings for Jane, which felt real and right to all of the play acting and the performing he had done just trying to fit in at nice, all of the lies he tried to tell himself, all of the inhuman ugliness of their ideology that he had tried to rap in pretty words, and when he couldn't do that to obfuscate them in big words, Mark is saved by a vision of the normal. And of course, ideas like that are one of the reasons C.S. Lewis is commonly scorned as a reactionary today. I mean, he believed in the value of a strong family. How could you do a thing like that? He felt maybe women would be happier as wives and mothers. I mean, what kind of a chauvinist like slope browed Neanderthal was he? But was he wrong? As I noted last week, and as should be obvious to anybody who ever took biology, the primary purpose of the sexual urge is to encourage the propagation of the species. Yes, there are lots of other things you can do with you, the sexual urge. There are lots of other things you can do with your feet, but at the end of the day, your feet are made for walking, not playing piano. And while it's fashionable to bash the family as a patriarchal outmoded institution, and has been for a few decades in fact, the traditional family, and by that I don't mean the nuclear family, I mean the extended family where you had several generations living near each other, typically in land that they had been on for generations, sometimes centuries. That model worked reasonably well at producing a stable, happy, and functional society. Ideas become traditions because they have been consistently shown to work. You may be noting, but, well, hey, we don't need more people now. I think population decline is a good thing. We're already overpopulated. And those ideas would have found a happy ear at nice, as Professor Filistrato explains. I would not have any birds either. On the art tree, I would have the art birds all singing when you press a switch inside the house. When you are tired of the singing, you switch them off. Consider again the improvement. No feathers dropped about. No nests. No eggs. No dirt. It sounds, said Mark, like abolishing pretty well all organic life. And why not? It is simple hygiene. Listen, my friends, if you pick up some rotten thing and find this organic life crawling over it, do you not say, oh, the horrid thing, it is alive, and then drop it? Go on, said Winter. And you, especially you English, are you not hostile to any organic life except your own on your own body? Rather than permit it, you have invented the daily bath. That's true. What do you call dirty dirt? Is it not precisely the organic? Minerals are clean dirt. But the real filth is what comes from organisms. Sweat, spittles, excretions. Is not your whole idea of purity one huge example? The impure and the organic are interchangeable conceptions. What are you driving at, Professor, said Gould? After all, we are organisms ourselves. I grant it, that is the point. In us, organic life has produced mind. It has done its work. 
After that, we want no more of it. We do not the, want the world any more furred over with organic life, like what you call the blue mold. All sprouting and budding and breeding and decaying, we must get rid of it. By little and little, of course, slowly we learn how. Learn to make our brains live with less and less body. Learn to build our bodies directly with chemicals. No longer have to stuff them full of dead brutes and weeds. Learn how to reproduce ourselves without copulation. I don't think that would be much fun, said Winter. My friend, you've already separated the fun, as you call it, from the fertility. The fun itself begins to pass away. I know that's not what you think, but look at your English women. Six out of ten are frigid, are they not? You see, nature herself begins to throw away the anachronism. When she has quite thrown it away, then real civilization becomes possible. You would understand if you were peasants. Why would you try to work with stallions and bulls? No, no, we want geldings and oxen. There will never be peace and order and discipline so long as there is sex. When man has thrown it away, then he will become finally governable. And if we look today at a society that's been soaked with porn for years now, we see a growing rise in asexuality, people trying to make a name and an identity for themselves by expressing how loudly they're disinterested in sex, we're seeing people opt for casual hookups over relationships, and in many cases, we're seeing young men retreat to their bedrooms with a jar of hand lotion and a list of their favorite porn sites. They have neither interest in nor desire for any kind of a romantic relationship, certainly for any kind of a family relationship. They've been Pavlov conditioned into equating sex with images on a screen. And of course, fertility rates in the West among ethnic Europeans have declined precipitously. They've also declined in Japan, which is another highly industrialized country and one which has a pretty fair amount of available porn. And so a lot of people have been inspired by thinkers like Tolkien, like Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, to go back and look at those traditional family structures, go back and look at the expectations of marriage, the demands of family, because I think the great attraction from Tol for Tolkien and Lewis wasn't just the happy elves. It hearkened back to a time that never was but should have been, this mythic time. The Portuguese call it Shadade. It's this longing for a place you've never seen or a past that never was. If you want to catch a musical example of it, Edward Elgar's Cello Concerto is somebody looking back after World War I to the Edwardian age and the green fields and the countryside and all the accoutrements of decent living in the heyday of the British Empire before the big wars came. For the post-war audiences that read Lewis and Tolkien, they had that same elegiac feel. You read those as a reminder of everything you had lost, everything that could have been and never was. They reminded us in the 60s that we'd lost our green fields, whether it was to the nice tearing up edge stow, to our rivers catching fire. Today, maybe they can remind us of something more important. Maybe they can remind us that we've lost our souls. And I know a lot of people would feel like this message is crazy, this message is foolish. You're, you're not the first person to have objections. I, I struggle with the story myself. First century Romans did not have all the scientific technology we do. They were still aware of where babies came from, and they still knew that as a general rule, virgins don't have babies. But when you look at the edifice people built in his name, when you look at the culture that rose up after Charles Bartel drove back the Muslims at Tours, 
when you see all those long centuries of accomplishment, when you see the spirit that drove our people, that's driven our people for 1,500 years, longer in some cases, it's hard to deny that there is some power behind that name and there is some power behind that church. And you don't have to understand that power. In fact, the Catholic Church would teach that you cannot understand that power, but it would teach you that your understanding can lead you toward that power. It can lead you, however shakily, toward that true harbor. Today we've seen a movement towards making fantasy more realistic. George R. R. Martin would probably be the best source. I mean, Martin was obviously influenced by Tolkien's Middle Earth when he created Westeros, but where Tolkien and Lewis's heroes are generally well-meaning, if flawed, people stumbling, however imperfectly, toward the light, motivations are generally simpler in Westeros, as in the modern world, everybody's looking for money, sex, and power. Where Tolkien and Lewis loved the structure of the fairy tales, Martin sees them as a jumping-off point and frequently subverts the reader's expectations. The opening chapter of Game of Thrones starts out with a beautiful golden-haired princess, her brother, a handsome knight beside her, and a starry-eyed boy watching them. Before it's over, you just, you find the golden-haired knight, Jamie Lannister, in bed with his sister, Cersei Lannister. The starry-eyed boy, Bran Stark, gets pushed off a wall and paralyzed. And this certainly makes for good storytelling and good television. We all remember how the much-loved Viper gets killed by the mountain after he spears him in the side. Who could forget the Red Wedding? But while Martin has a remarkable gift for cataloging all sorts of sins and all sorts of atrocities in loving detail, there's really not a lot of salvation to be found amidst all that sin. In a 2013 interview with Rolling Stone, George R. R. Martin said, One of the things I wanted to explore with Jamie and with so many of the characters is the whole issue of redemption. When can we be redeemed? Is redemption even possible? I don't have an answer. But when do we forgive people? You see it all around you, in society, in constant debates. Should we forgive Michael Vick? I have friends who are dog lovers who will never forgive Michael Vick. Michael Vick has served years in prison. He's apologized. Has he apologized sufficiently? Woody Allen. Is Woody Allen someone that we should laud or someone that we should despise? Or Roman Polanski, Paula Dean? Our society is full of people who have fallen in one way or another. And what do we do with those people? How many good acts make up for a bad act? If you're a Nazi war criminal and then spend the next 40 years doing good deeds and feeding the hungry, does that make up for being a concentration camp guard? I don't know the answer, but those are questions worth thinking about. I want there to be a possibility of redemption for us because we all do terrible things. We should be able to be forgiven because if there is no possibility of redemption, what's the answer then? And I could tell Martin was definitely raised Roman Catholic. He's got our do definition of sin down pat. He is absolutely right. Both Lewis and Tolkien would have agreed with him that we have all done bad things and that we all desperately need forgiveness. Where they would differ is, for them, there was no question of who the Redeemer was. Because Martin has walked away from Christianity, walked away from the idea of redemption, about the best he can do is give you a world where things are morally ambiguous. Jamie sometimes does good deeds and is sometimes good and noble, and sometimes he's screwing his sister. Tyrion Lannister chases whores, but he's a smart fellow and he's funny. But for most of Martin's characters, their only purpose is to climb as high as possible up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. 
the two characters who do appear to have some greater cause, Melisandre, the Red Priestess of Rilior, and Danny Targaryen, well, Melisandre talks Stannis Baratheon into burning his daughter alive, and Danny Targaryen uses her dragon to slaughter the innocent citizens of King's Landing. Tolkien and Lewis both wanted to remind us there is a higher power. Martin seems more concerned with warning us to be very careful about people who are pointing towards a higher power or towards a greater cause. And Martin is definitely a very, very skilled world designer. That's a big thing nowadays. You can make a lot of money designing a world. The Tolkien universe, I'm sure you've heard of the Disney universe, the Marvel universe. Now, he's very good with the details. In that 2014, it was 2014, by the way, not 2013, as I said earlier, interview with Rolling Stone, Martin complained, Lord of the Rings had a very medieval philosophy that if the king was a good man, the land would prosper. We look at real history, and it's not that simple. Tolkien could say that Aragorn became king and reigned for a hundred years, and he was wise and good, but Tolkien doesn't answer the question. What was Aragorn's tax policy? Did he maintain a standing army? What did he do in times of flood and famine? And what about all those orcs? By the end of the war, Sauron is gone, but all of the orcs aren't gone. They're in the mountains. Did Aragorn pursue a policy of systematic genocide and kill them? Even the little baby orcs in their little orc cradles? And what I think Tolkien and Lewis got, which Martin absolutely misses, is... Yes, those are myths, but those myths were very important to medieval society, to the society of late antiquity, to pre-Christian society. If the king is a good man, the land will prosper. Well, that means if you're a king, you have a responsibility to behave as a good man, to behave as a moral land. If you don't, not only you will suffer, your subjects will suffer. Your dukes, your knights will suffer. Your dukes and your knights and your peasants all expect you to be a good man. If you're not a good man, they have motivation to see that you are replaced with a good man. Now keep in mind, kingdoms and fiefdoms in the day of medieval England in smaller times than that, you know, your ruler could have been, could be ruling over a few thousand people. The kingdom of Judea during the days of David and Solomon, he may have had 20,000 subjects. So we're not talking, the king did not have quite so much power as when you're thinking of an emperor. And I'd argue that the Roman Empire did very much better under the good emperor Marcus Aurelius than it did under any of the bad emperors, so there does appear to be something to that idea. For Tolkien and Lewis, that was a myth. It was a story that point towards a greater truth. If the king is good, the land will prosper. We understand things are more complicated than that. We all know there's more to running a kingdom than being wise and good. But what Tolkien was trying to do, what Lewis tried to do, was point us towards those platonic ideals of the good king, the just king. They tried to give us examples of little men in big troubles, you know, flawed men like ourselves, flawed women who found a better way, who found their way to the light despite their struggles. Martin can give us the details of these worlds. He can give us the historic struggle. He can give us great scenes that are very exciting, but he really doesn't do spiritual struggles. And, and so while he catches a lot of the feel of an Iron Age world, of an, of an early Middle Ages world, he doesn't capture the spiritual struggle that would have been a pretty big part of people's lives. And so I feel like he, Martin, and a lot of other artists and writers today, they play the notes, but they lose the underlying music. I would like to 
end tonight with an excerpt from the poem which Tolkien wrote to Lewis, which helped inspire him to convert. The name of the poem was Philomethus to Misomethus. You look at trees and label them just so, for trees are trees and growing is to grow. You walk the earth and tread with solemn pace, one of the many minor globes of space. A star's a star, some matter in a ball, compelled to courses mathematical, amidst the regimented cold inane, where destined atoms are at each moment slain. I will not walk with your progressive apes, erect and sapient, before them gapes the dark abyss to which their progress tends, if by God's mercy progress ever ends, and does not ceaselessly revolve the same unfruitful course with changing of a name. I will not tread your dusty path and flat, denoting this and that by this and that. Your world immutable, wherein no part the little maker has with maker's art. I bow not yet before the iron crown, nor cast my own small golden scepter down. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, this has been Notes from the End of Time. Thank you very much for listening. I'm Kenaz Filan, and may God bless us all, each and every one.